Please remain standing for our scripture reading from Amos 9.14, found in the Old Testament on page 858 in the Pew Bibles. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. And, they shall, uh, and this is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. I want to welcome everyone who is here joining us in worship today, and also anyone, everyone who had helped us making this worship possible. If you are here for the first time, please fill out our connection card so we'll be able to connect with you later on and want to see how God continues to work in our lives together. I also want to welcome everyone who is uh, joining online through our online worship service, wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in. And also want to thank our Rally Court Rehabilitation Center members as well. So with that in mind, what if we start with a word of prayer? Lord, we're thankful for, for gathering us here today as we are gathered in your name as one family and brothers and sisters in Christ. May you continue to bless us so we can become a blessing to the world. As we listen to your words and your words only, may our hearts be challenged, may our hearts be renewed, may our hearts be filled with your spirit to go out into the world for the transformation. Lord, we ask that you will be with us. But Lord, we also ask that you will be guiding every single word that I share. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be worthy in front of you, my Lord and my Savior. And may you be glorified. We thank you and pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I start, I forgot that I had not welcomed a dear friend of mine who is sitting here today. Reverend Andrew Whaley from Rally Court Presbyterian Church is joining here in worship. He surprised me uh, by walking in through the first door uh, and I asked, what about your church? And he said, I'm out of break. Uh, since he surprised me, I'm going to surprise him back by asking him to lead us with the benediction after this sermon. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. So we are here all gathered as saints. Saints who had experienced the hope and the, and the uh, joy of the resurrection. And there's always that question, what happens after resurrection? How should we continue to live? And one of the ways of us doing it, we want to use a movie and we want to use screen as a way for us to see what God is doing in the life of the church and also see how God will continue to challenge us to be part of God's mission. So for this claim, for this claim, I just wanted to share that we actually purchased the copyrights to show these movies, and we try to do it once or twice every year to show a movie and see what God is saying through those movies. And this week, we and this month, we will talk about the movie All Saints through our sermon series. We're going to start the sermon series today, and next Sunday we're going to have the UMW lead us in service also challenging us to see what God is doing through us. And then we will conclude the sermon series with, a, a, with, with two more weeks at the end of April. So in order for you to really follow through the sermon series, what I really need to do is I need to ask you to watch the movie. Now, in order for you to watch the movie, you can watch it uh, probably on uh, Netflix or all the other sites that you can rent a movie. But there are some who might want to do it together. That's why we provide this opportunity for you to watch the movie this Monday at 11 o'clock and this Friday at 7. This, the the luncheon uh, showing will be served, uh, start with the movie and then we will serve a lunch for you to eat with our members and then we will uh, we'll conclude the movie and it will take around two and a half, two and a half hours. If you are... Uh, on Wednesday, not on Friday. And if you are willing to come on a Friday evening after dinner, please come and join us at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary. We're just praying that the sun will go down by that time so we have enough uh, darkness in this room so we can focus onto this movie. Because this movie is a true story, a true story for Tennessee, and a true story of how God had used this church 
to create a community and also this church to continue to join in God's mission. It is, a, is based on a true story of All Saints Episcopal Church in Tennessee. But at the same time, we have to remember where it starts. It starts with the church in a brink of closure. There were only 30 members at the time, and the first worship set that Reverend Ma Michael had led had only 12 people gathered in the sanctuary. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that movie, but before we go that, let's talk about a reality of the churches that we are facing. The reality is 85% of the church in America are either plateaued or declining. And let me just have that sink into your heart. It's not okay because we might not be in that 85%. But it is something that we need to think about because we will see that 80, 48%, 46% of, of those people who are attending in a church, according to Barna Group, are attending in a church that is less than 100 people in attendance. So what that means is this 86% are all have a potential to face that reality happening in the life of their church. Only 37% of the people who are attending in a church on a weekly basis attending a church that has an average worship more than 100 to 499 attenders. And probably we might be in that bracket. We see another bracket of people who attend in a church who, are, who goes up to 500 to more than 1,000, but I would have to say it's only 17% of the Christian attendees who come to church on a regular basis, which means that it's good that we have good big churches and mega churches, but there is a need for more. If not, that we will see more and more churches closing. Because in the same study, we had saw that almost 70 churches will close on a given Sunday. How can we get out of this rut? How can we share the hope that is projected through the resurrection of Jesus Christ into this world if the churches are closing? That is a question that we will struggle with with the next couple weeks as we watch this movie and as we talk about this movie together. But I wanted to kind of transition coming out from this depressing news and transition into the challenge that I asked you in our last Easter Sunday service. I charged us with this challenge of saying, let's go out into the world and carry out that hope. Carry out the hope of resurrection. Carry out the hope that Jesus had victored and won over death. That Jesus conquered hell. That Jesus came back with the hope of the resurrection, knowing that God's eternal kingdom will reign forever. But we come to that question of asking, what in the world does it mean for us to carry out that hope? And how can we do that? It actually starts within our lives, but I also believe that it will continue on and project it through our congregation and through the fellowship of believers carrying out this hope into the world. But in order for us to find how we need to go back into the Bible. And that's why for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about Amos and talk about some other verses of the Bible, how God had shared the vision of restored, restoration. We're going to start from Amos chapter 9, verse 14, where it says, I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. And they will make gardens and eat their fruit. God is talking through Amos, this prophet, and willing Amos to go to the people of northern Israel. But before we go that, we need to talk about who Amos is. Amos has born, was born and uh, was active in the time of B.C. 750. 
And it was a time where Israelites were still divided. There was a northern kingdom and there was a southern kingdom. And like I said, for me, in my perspective, when I come from South Korea, South is always right. And South is always the good people, right? So the southern kingdom were very small, but it was a kingdom, uh, there was a tribe of Judea and Benjamin who were uh, trying to be as pure as possible, finding their ways. Of course, they were corrupt. Of course, they were distracted. Of course, they did not always live up to the covenant, but at least in the point of view, compared to the northern Israelites, they were doing better. Now, why in the world the northern Israelites were condemned to be more corrupt at that time? It's because when God had promised, uh, led them to the promised land, God asked them not to assimilate with other cultures. But the northern Israelites had assimilated and that had become something that disobeyed God's order. So with this animosity, think about Amos, whose name means carrying the burden. Now I wanted to kind of go back and look at the challenge that we had last week. What were we asked to do? We were asked to go and carry the hope. In the same way, Amos started with carrying out the burden but at the end of his book, God had prophesied and talked through him of actually carrying out the hope. I'm going to go back to Amos. He was going back, he was going to northern Israel, where he was not, like I said, considered as a friendly voice. On top of that, Abraham, uh, Amos was a shepherd. So at the time, you're not even the priest line. And you are coming to another country and saying harsh things in the name of God. Think of what kind of hostility that Amos must have gone through. But he still went to carry out the prophecy of God. There are three reasons why the Israelites were condemned in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to read that from Amos chapter 1 and 2. It says, Because of the three great sins of Israel, make that four, I am not putting up with them any longer. They buy and sell upstanding people. People for them are only things, ways of making money. They sell a poor man for a pair of shoes. They sell their own grandmother. They grind the penniless into the dirt and shove the luckless into the ditch. Let me just stop here. For, can we go back? Let me just stop here. So one of the things that we see from Israelites is that they were filled with greed, that they will do anything for their own benefit. And this is from the message version. And they actually did what they actually did. They dehumanized people. And in a way, they also traded people for their own interests. They say that how they were trading men for a shoe, and they were also trading their own kins. The other thing, and the other sin that God had pointed out of the Israelites, were how they were ignorant through the cry of the poor. It says that they grinded the penniless into the dirt. And they shoved the luckless into the ditch. When we are trying to accumulate more, what happens as a consequence? It's a natural progression that we naturally oppress or take away from the poor. And when we are focused onto our own interests, what happens? We close our eyes and our ears to the need of the needy. That's the second sin that... God had pointed out. Now, the reason why I stopped here was I wanted to make sure that the parents uh, guard their children because there's a word that I do not like our children to hear. The next one would be this. Everyone and his brother sleeps with the sacred whore, a sacrilege against my holy name. Stuff they extorted from the poor is piled up in shrine of their God while they sit around drinking wine they've conned from their victims. The reason why we talk about that word is because they started participating in idolatry and as a product of idolatry, there were things 
that happened that shouldn't be happened. And this is the time of the Israelites, the people of God, sinning against God. And I wanted to kind of condense this into one reason. I believe it was because they were selfish. If you get this picture, you're, you're, you're close to millennials. <laughs> the root of all these sins were selfish, selfishness. When God had made a covenant with God's people, God asked His people to follow His own ways, uh, God's ways, not their own ways. When God made that covenant, it was an intentional covenant that was made to let go of our own ways and follow God's ways only. But what happened? The Israelites in the time as they had experienced God's presence in their lives, they slowly put God's ways away and started to have their ways creep into the throne of their heart again. Selfishness is the root of most of the crimes that they were committing. Because they were self-centered and because they were selfish, what happens? There were greed that emerged and grew in their hearts. If you're greedy and you want more and more and more, you will do anything, we will do anything to fulfill our greed. We will even dehumanize others. We will close our eyes from the need and the cry of the poor. And we might even go out and worship other idols. Now the idols that we see in the word is a little bit different from the idols that we might have. Of course at that time there were these idols that they worshipped and there were these, um, these tablets that they bowed down to. There were these religious practices they participated in. But let me tell you what these all come from. When they were in the promised land and they started a new type of lifestyle. They were engaged in agriculture. So what did they do? They started worshiping Baal as a means and a God who will help them, who they thought who will help them in their new endeavor. When they were in a war, they would go unto another idol because that idol was known to be charge of war. And what that happened is, because of their greed of wanting to succeed, not completely relying on God, they started to put their eyes onto other things. And we might not have those figures that we consider as idols anymore. We might not have those carvings in our lives anymore that was sustainable. But what do we have? Because of our greed and our selfishness, don't we have some other idols that creep into our heart, like money, like control, like safety, or like comfort, or pleasure. All these idols that were rooted from our own selfish desires were destatable in front of God. Because what God really wanted was our hearts to follow God's will. That is the reason why we need to, when we see ourselves projected through the life of the Israelites, that's when we need to go back onto the purpose. Amos chapter 3 verse 2 says, You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Now, there's a lot of times that we will focus more on to that third verse and saying, whoa, that God, I just don't like that God. But I'll tell you, the reason why God says this and shares this in a way is because God had put a lot of responsibility and the promise onto us. God actually started it from Abraham, and that is the reason why we need to go back onto the purpose where God had called us. I hope that the first two verse rings Genesis chapter two, 12, verse 1 to 2 in your hearts. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. If we go to Genesis chapter 12, God actually says, I have chosen you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so you can be a blessing to all nations. 
That is what God had done and God's purpose was. God's purpose was to call us for God's glory so we can be a blessing to the world. But what happened? Even in the church, we become selfish. We claim our own ways. We claim our own comfort. And we claim our own gospel closing our ears to the needy, closing our eyes onto the world that needs this hope. And when even God's church loses that purpose, what happens? We're bound to decline. That is the reason why we need to go back onto this call of God being our true Lord. And it is a time that God calls us for repentance, to let go of our own ways and start being ready to be part of God's mission. Like I said, I asked what would have happened after Easter? Jesus had came and should have talked with his disciples for 40 days. And what do you think the conversation would have been about? I think and imagine that it might have been about how God is going to use them to be part, to build God's eternal kingdom. I believe Jesus would have said, hey, don't know more of your own ways. See what will happen when you follow God's ways. Remember how Jesus was wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, not my will, but may your will be done. Follow God's will. See how I had resurrected from the dead. Don't fear the world. Don't fear death. Don't fear persecution. But follow God's way and see what God will do. And that is our call. And that is the reason why I still believe that God has a purpose and a hope that should be shared through our churches. Because I believe that when people of God all comes with that obedience and holding on to the vision of God of restoration, the gathering that we have will shine the light of Jesus into this world. And that is where we come to why we had chosen this movie. Like I said, All Saints is a true story of a pastor who was sent to All Saints Episcopal Church in Tennessee with one purpose. Well, that purpose was to close the deal with the developers and sell the church and make it into a giant supermarket. All he had to do was to come and preach for the next six months and make all the inventories, gather all the gatherings of the church, the belongings, and sell it off, make any kind of profit, and close the deal. That was his purpose. So when Michael comes in on the first day and he is there in front of 12 and they see the closure of the church coming. But there were some people, as he was get, getting to know the people, there was, he had detected that some of the people still had the vision of God to overturn this church. So in one way, as a pastor, he did this. He made a flyer. And he made a flyer about the church and he posted it in the community. None of the people of the community responded to that flyer except this group of Burmese refugees who saw the flyer and came to the church. Now the reason why they chose that church is because they were Anglicans. They were missionaries in Burma who came and showed them the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ in their lives. And they came and they had this journey to come all the way from Burma to the states in Tennessee. And they saw this flyer as a hope carried out to their situation. On the first Sunday, they had around 20 coming in with their shoes off. 
because that was their culture. And imagine the 12 people were sitting there and having these 12, 20 Burmese coming in. The next week they had 40. Next week they had 60. And they wanted to have some food because they did not have enough, they, they, were, they didn't have a job. So what they did, they asked the pastor if they can farm in the land of the church. So the pastor says that that might be a possibility and he is now talking with the developers and contractors and saying, what if you just leave that portion of the land open so these people can continue to grow and harvest their crops for this year? And the developers say, no, we need to bulldoze this building as soon as possible. I don't know if that was a God moment. I don't know if God had used him for that reason, but he was a person with some kind of impulse. And he said, no, where the deal is over and get out of here right now. Remember, he was sent here for one reason, to close the church. And he had overthrown that purpose. And now he's standing in the field and he sees and hears God's voice. And I want to show you a scene, which we are all copyrighted to show you of how he responds to God's command. Where have you been? The bishop called twice. I think God spoke to me. God spoke to me. He wants us to turn the land around the church into a farm. God spoke to you. Be God. Yeah. Yeah, there's just the one aim. Mm. What did he say? He said, I've given you land, I've given you farmers. Do the map. God said, do the map. <laughs> what what do you mean um a farm? A farm, you know, crops. And do what with them? Oh, we feed the Korean, we sell the rest, pay the mortgage, save the church. Um, hang on. Uh, what happened to the land developers? Did they say no? Yeah. I mean, not exactly. Oh, no. We would have been out of here in a week. Michael, you're doing it again. You're, you're sabotaging another job. Ames, God spoke to me. To me, I think he's been speaking to me all along with the salad trucks and the Korean farmers. God wants us to save this little church by making the land into a farm. Sometimes when God speaks to us, there are some things that we cannot comprehend. Sometimes when God speaks to us, sometimes it might be illogical. People might call us crazy. People might say, you're out of your mind. But I believe that when we get away from our selfish ways, God will speak to us in ways that we might seem to be crazy. The question is, when that co voice comes to your life, or when that voice comes to our church, are you willing to obey? I believe that restoring hope and carrying out that hope into the world only comes by us restoring God's call in our lives. And I believe that our call is unique and our call is still to be fulfilled. Of course, I'm not saying that we should turn our land into a farm. But there should be a unique call that God is asking us to carry on. The question is, are you willing to be obedient to God's will, even though it might sound crazy? Even though it might call us to do things that are different from our own ways. 
even though it might require us to sacrifice a bit. If it is God's will, are we willing and ready to launch on and follow His way? That is the question that we will wrestle with with the next couple of weeks as we watch the movie and as we look into the Bible in the lens of that movie. So I want to join you in this journey of asking God that question. And with that in mind, I want to end by asking, are you ready to be obedient to God's ways and God's ways only? Let us have a word. Lord, we come to you letting go of our selfish ways. We repent by confessing that we still have idols in our own lives. Our idols might not be in the same form of the idols that the Israelites had worshipped. Our idols might be in our own ways of looking for our own happiness, looking for our own success, looking for our own comfort, and even focusing our eyes only on our loved ones instead of looking out into the world. We cast away all our idols, and we ask that your spirit will continue to cultivate our hearts so we can be part of your transforming mission. Invite us. Help us to join into your mission to share and carry the hope of your resurrection to this community. Help us to be obedient to your call whenever you ask us to do something. Help us to follow with our heart, not with our heads. Help us to follow the way of the cross about your love of how you had even died for us. Help us to imitate what you had done in our lives. So we come to you with a desire to follow your wills. And we come to you with a prayer that says, Lord, not my will, but may your will be done. We thank you. Pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.